Welcome to Chartwell Chats, a series of discussions over two years with leading historians and experts, which explores Sir Winston Churchill's relationship with Chartwell, not only through the property's collections, but also through historic moments in time. Chartwell Chats was developed and is jointly presented by the National Trust Chartwell and the International Churchill Society UK. We're working together to preserve the historic legacy of Sir Winston Churchill. We hope you enjoy it. Today we are at Chartwell and doing the second of our Chartwell chats and it is with great pleasure that I'm going to be chatting to Bruff Scott. Bruff has in one way or another devoted his entire life to horse racing, having begun riding and then moved through broadcasting and writing. Having also studied history at Oxford University, he was able to blend his unique knowledge and passion into writing biographies with a particularly equine lean. Bruff's book, Churchill at the Gallop, came out in 2017 and charts the hugely important role that horses played throughout Winston Churchill's life. And as part of his research for that book, he came here to Chartwell. So first of all, I should say, welcome back to Winston Churchill's home. How does it feel to be back? It's, it's, it's a very special pleasure because coming here when I was doing the research for the book was was terrific because anybody who sort of thinks they might write something about Churchill, um, if not careful, particularly not a professional historian or anything like me, you get completely overwhelmed by the whole enormity of what he did and also all the books written about him. And and I had this sort of idea of being around about Churchill and his horses, particularly Churchill and racing, but I found it much more interesting that how physically he was involved with horses. And then the only thing I could do, because I did know about horses uh, and physically had been with them, and I'd been around, uh, I'd also, my grandfather was a great friend of Churchill, called Jack Seeley, uh, and my mother, you know, he built sandcastles for my mother and that sort of stuff. So I had a little bit of family memory. I needed to try and get close to where he went. And I went to Blenheim and walked all around there. And, and I, I went to Sandhurst and I went to, Harrow and, I, you know, and, and to come here for the end of his life when of course horses became, then he had race horses and bred horses. I mean he was a very successful breeder, it was extraordinary. I mean he's, because he did so much other things in life and because he was such a um, huge politician and author, which are intellectual things, people forget about the physical things. So if they come to Chartwell and physically go around, and that's the sort of writing I do anyway, the only thing I can do is offer a bit of physicality, because I have done some physical things. And I think to try and inhabit how he did things, and then you know, when you read all his letters and things, you, you, you read about his physical thing, him complaining about he was getting fat and that sort of stuff. Well, he used to complain that the, the scales were fixed against him. Uh, you would complain, things like that. But no, it was very, very fascinating to come here. So uh, it's a delight to come back. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And in terms of charting Winston Churchill and horses, I think it might be an idea to go back to the, the very start, literally the very start. Um, are you able to tell us about how horses played a role in um, his, his birth, in fact? Yeah, because uh, it, it was almost certainly because his... Uh, mother, uh, Jenny, was uh, driven too fast in a little trap that brought on his, his, his birth. Uh, and as you know, he was born early, born, born meant to be, she was meant to be at a ball, so he was born in the side room at Blenheim. I mean, again, that's one of the lovely things, is to go to Blenheim. And then his very first letter to his mother, which, by the way, age five, and it's written in good round lines, and it's got, I mean, it's a hundred word letter. I mean, my grandchildren wrote me letters, but they, don't, they tend to be five, pretty limited. And it, it includes, I rode Rob Roy in the park this morning. He was very fresh. And Chapman, who was the groom, had to ride him round the ring 20 times, and then he went out in the park on the leading rain. But I mean, to ride, so a pony was already very high in his thoughts. And that's age five? That's age five. Wow. Uh, and I, I, I think that, again, the same point about physical, however much the intellectual is part of, what, part of something, you still inhabit your own body. Uh, and people forget that Churchill, the most exciting physical things he did were on horseback. 
And when he started, he was a very weedy child. Uh, he had done things, and he, he got going, but when he went to Sandhurst, which is a pretty interesting thing, you, uh, everyone imagines Churchill, because of his huge reputation, they think of him and, as a very big man, because he wasn't very tall, but they didn't know he was, they think of him as a round figure with a cigar and all that. But when he went to Sandhurst, he was f under five foot seven and he had a 31 inch chest. Well, I was always pretty light as a jockey. You know. I had a 36 inch chest, a 31 inch chest. And he wrote to his mother saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm cursed with so feeble a frame. I can hardly bear the ordinary burdens of the day. And he collapsed on the parade ground just carrying his son. So to try and prove himself physically, and the way he did it was to become good at riding. And it, as you, you know, if, the highest achievement in his life at sort of 19, at that stage probably, was what he'd be most, most satisfied with, was the fact that at Sandhurst, out of 127, everybody had to take the riding exam. He was second in the riding exam. That was his biggest distinction so far. Uh, and you know, he, 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 riding was very, very important. And I think that you, you don't ever want to eliminate the physical things people do. Uh, and in a funny way, because of all the other stuff, I think it had been rather ignored. And so when I was doing it, it was fascinating me because no one had had tapped this. And people were encouraging me, oh, I didn't think of that. And if you read all the letters, which is the thing I did, because trying to read, I did speed read quite a lot of books and you check out things, but I can't get involved in all the historical stuff really, but I can understand the historical stuff. And if you look at the letters, which are all quoted, but they never quote them, it's about riding. Mm. You know, the, he's writing things about the political situation to his mother when he's 20, but he's also m mentioning a horse he's backed and that sort of thing. It starts and ends the letter from Cuba uh, with, well done with gold key winning at Nottingham. I mean, you know, th this is absolutely part of his head as to what they do in racing and what happens in riding. That's really interesting that it is such a constant thread, as you say, that he, it's in his correspondences and he's referencing it so often. You mentioned Sandhurst, of course, where he trained, and then after that he moved into the fourth assault. So at that point, his experience with horses diversifies, you could say, because he's, yes, a cavalry officer, but he's also playing polo so, and pleasure riding. So what would you say that that time encapsulates for him? Well, again, it's worth well, you don't forget the, that he was born in 1874. The first, the first car on the road in Britain was until 1894. So horses and horse things were absolutely central. And that's why racing, rather, was absolutely huge because that was the fastest a person could go unless you jumped off a cliff and committed suicide. You know, in open air, it's the fastest you could actually travel, uh, you know, actually if you know, with something underneath you. And then jockeys were hugely lionised because they were the people who walked with kings. They were the footballers of today. Uh, and, the, the, and hunting was a huge thing, going hunting. And his parents were mad about hunting. I mean, you, when Lord Randolph was at Oxford, he had, a, he, had, he had a thing called the Blenheim Harriers. And when they were in Ireland, which were Churchill's first sort of memory of riding on donkeys, uh, they, I mean, the, Jenny wrote, you know, I'm obsessed with hunting. And again, now people sort of limit because hunting sort of passed. But it was really, really important. And it was a social thing too. I mean, he went to the, the opening meet of the Quorn. There's a really good picture in the book I have. Um, the opening meet of the Quorn, I mean, all the sort of important people in Britain so, who were physically active would want to go hunting. And to go to the meet in Churchill, as you know, was a fantastic networker and a very upwardly pushing you know, to try and get around. And so he would, and he, when he came back from the, he made some money after the ball war with all his lectures. He went, he went, <laughs> he, he had four hunters and his, his cousin, the Duke of Marlborough, who after wasn't noted complete sort of poverty man, wrote to him saying, Winston, you're being far too extravagant. You don't need four hunters. I mean, he had f 14 days hunting in two months. I mean, he, he was, he was, Again, he got obsessive about the riding. It wasn't just that he could ride. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. That was his physical thing. And polo was his game. And 
And anyone who's ever been in, involved in sport will have, if they've got any sort of level at it, will have a memory they have of a Royal Rovers moment, something they did. That they scored 50 or 100 or they, they, they scored a goal. Thing. Well, Churchill had his moment because when the Fourth Hussars, when they were in India, they were the big thing. In, in polo, in India, was, between regiments, was huge, interregimental polo. And he won, the team won the final, 4-3, and who scored a hat-trick? Winston Churchill. And being, you know, he couldn't do things. He actually did it, though, with his arm tied up, because he's actually, he wrenched it out of its socket and fallen down the stairs. Uh, and so he had it, so he actually, there were only tap-ins, but he, he spent, he had four players in polo, as he couldn't, you know, he's very good tactically, but as he couldn't really whack it hard, he just was a spoiler. So they had an absolutely ace player, the opposing team, and he just went and sort of marked him out of the game, which drove the guy absolutely mad, apparently. And then it so happened that because he was around, he had little, little tap-ins like that. But I mean, he, he scored a hat-trick in the most important polo game of his life. You know. And he was playing for the, for the House of Commons team when he was Chancellor of Exchequer. I mean, you know, Hang on a second. This is, you, you don't do that. It was, it was a, um, the physical thing of riding was very, very important to him. So we've just been speaking about the, the fun side of it, the thrill, the sport, the adventure. I wonder if we could move into those moments in his life where his life has depended on horses, and I'm thinking particularly in battle. So back to the Battle of Omdurman. What was... The role that his horse played at that well, moment. Uh, again, we say about the physical side of, of, of a, a sporting memory, but you're going to have moments if you've ever done them, and also most of my generation, where my son has been involved, in, have, have not been in situations where people are trying to kill you. Um, but Churchill, on horseback, in the army, had times when people were trying to kill him, uh, and the. the it was worth saying that um, uh, uh, the first time is he actually deliberately went. Wh where was he on his 21st birthday? Most people can remember where they were on his 21st birthday. Sometimes with, with slight shame or whatever, but they can't remember roughly where they were. And most people can't remember, even some Churchill um, pundits, where was Churchill, what was he doing on his 21st birthday? The answer was on horseback in Cuba, being shot at for the first time. And he wanted to find out what it was like being shot at. Only he, it's quite a long story how he got there, but nonetheless, that's what he was doing. He, he didn't actually get, the bullets missed him, but he, he didn't actually fire much himself. But at Omdurman, he was then, that was in the campaign done against the uh, Mahdi uh, to try and uh, avenge what had happened down uh, at, at, to Khartoum. And he was involved with the 21st Lancers, he mentioned it again, he got himself into the 21st Lancers, and, and this is with a sword, drawn sword, and he is on a polo pony, little, little small pony type horse, therefore not a great big thoroughbred, but not a plodder, uh, a little whippity horse, and they are, get involved in a charge at what look like, but I mean a, a cavalry charge, and there are 300 of them, 21st Lancers, and the cavalry charge at what looked like to clear what looked like a group of people blocking the way, 400, looked like, looked like a few hundred. When they got towards them, they suddenly discovered they were double the people because they actually was in a dip in the, in the, in the desert, it's this wild desert near the Nile. But Churchill was on his horse, and they were, they, Galloping, it was the official charge, 1890, what are we, are we, we are in 1899, aren't we? Uh, I think, yes, 1899, 1898 we are. And you, know, you have to stick back to, you know, this is sort of back in time. These guys are, or cartridge bits, but they've got rifles, haven't got machine guns. But you're galloping at them and with a sword drawn. Uh, Churchill, Typical Churchill, because of this shoulder injury I talked about in polo, he had permission, even though he'd do the ordinary, you trot along with your sword up like this, it's a proper long swords, 
uh, and if you turn to charge, you then charge like that. He got permission, because of his shoulder injury, to put it back in. When, once they went to charge, to put it back in the uh, scabbard and then pull out his uh, uh, pistol, and use a pistol in the charge. Now, that's actually how I started my book, because actually I read this when we were talking about the possibility. I suddenly thought, hang on, that's what he definitely did. And everyone accepts that and wrote about it. I thought, well, actually, I'm not sure that's very easy. You know, okay, I was a professional writer. You have a sword up here and put it back into there and then pull a pistol out of here. You know, and you've, got your, you've also got the horse here. That's actually not very easy. And I actually did it on a horse, so just walking along. So, OK, you've got the horse here. You've got to put that back into there. Then you've got to get this here. OK, fine. So let's do it again. Now, that's me walking along. This is... People, turn, people, people are very revved up because people are shooting at them. There's bullets coming at you. And you're then going to gallop. And as you gallop, you then put it in. Yeah, well, that actually, if you can do that, that's right. Because if you, to be blunt, and it's not really conceit. Because if you've been a professional rider, a professional jockey for ten years, so you, 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 you know about these. You also think that other people can't ride, really. You, you think, oh, Churchill could ride, but he can't ride really much. You know, okay, fat old chap. No, no, no. Hang on. If you could do that, you could ride. You could ride. And what's more. You then gallop, and then as an experience, you gallop, and the actual charge was about, you said it was, it was the length of a polo field, so it's, it's, it's a 300, 400 yards, quarter of a mile. So you've got plenty of time to sort of think, a thundering towards them, and everybody's very, very wound up because actually um, the 21st Lancers, uh, they'd never, for various reasons, ever actually been in a full on combat, and so they. The, the nickname that other regiments gave them was they sh "Thou shalt not kill," uh, <laughs> which is very, very harsh. So they were, they were again probably didn't need itching for a charge, which they did. And the thing was the charge, and they came thundering in as Churchill came there. And of course, the great thing is he's probably the best, uh, uh, one of the greatest journalists who ever lived, uh, and he and he can have wonderful recollection. I mean, he can write the letter to his mother when he's five. So when he's 25, he can, 24 he was here, now he could write this straight away. Yeah. As he, he's got these guys shooting, and as they get there, you can see there's a dip and a lot of other people in there. So he's coming thundering in. He, 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 he aims his revolver at the guy firing at him. He, he literally jumps through he's on a horse like this. Uh, he's got a pistol. Uh, the bullets, the guy shoots, the guy behind him is killed. He then goes through, and it, as I say, there's a group of people here. There's a dip then, which, which was hidden from people before. I don't forget, it's this desert, so it's, so it's um, dry. Uh, and then you drop down five foot into the dip where there's other people, and then you go across out like a dry riverbed. And he writes about it, the pony dropped like a cat. Uh, down into the river and up the other side through people. And then there's a guy on the a guy lying on the ground, and he looks at him. He doesn't. He, he suddenly realizes the guy on the ground has got a sword, a scimitar. You know those scimitars because we're talking. It's like little middle ages, and what they do, it's a classic thing against cavalry, is you slash it round and it cuts the, it cuts the tendon of the horse. Just like shooting a tyre. So the horse is disabled. The horse is disabled, you pull the guy off and chop him up. And I mean, we are talking about chopping up. You know, we're talking, the Mahdi were, you know, extremely brilliant fighters in a sort of medieval way. And the guy there, he sees it, and Churchill shoots him there. I mean, to the extent that the guy comes, the, the, the pistol, his hand hits the pistol. And then he comes around and he shoots another person and he says, you know, how easy it is to kill a man. Uh, when it came to the war years, and you have, after all, what is a 60, whatever it is, 67-year-old 
68 year old man, florid voice, um, invoking old poetry about get up and atom type thing. Um, it, it, when you hear people doing bombastic things now, um, you think, well, you've never done anything. But he, he was saying it from the heart because he had actually done it. And I think that is, a, in a way, you can, it was authentic. I mean, some people think it was too warlike, but he, he, we were, Britain was back to the wall, and there was someone there who he absolutely sort of was prepared to, and he, he, he was sort of talked about having a machine gun himself, but he had actually done it. And I think to go through that experience, and it was because he could ride that, I mean, you know, the, the, the things I'm describing are technical and, and dropping like a cat at gallop. You, 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 so you've got to know what to do. In the ball war, he had a moment when his riding skill, again, 100% saved his life because basically he's suddenly his horse is, is away. He, they are ambushed. Uh, he's having to run and people are shooting and he's going to be picked off because he's running. And suddenly a guy comes galloping along on horseback. And there is a, there was then, we're talking about 1899, 1900, there's a practice, it's cavalry skill, of if you're, you're on the ground and someone else has got a horse, that you run up and, and swing yourself up behind them. You do it by their, them letting their foot out of the stirrup. You put your foot in the stirrup and vault up. And the guy, the guy comes galloping towards him, and he's able to go and, I've got a bad leg, but put your foot in the stirrup, and then throws himself up behind. And he did that, and actually he gallops, and it's a, it was a, a brilliantly written exchange, a point exchange, because they're galloping away, and, but the bullets are going, and uh, the, uh, the church was holding, as you can imagine, he's galloping along behind this guy, and he's holding onto the man's sort of clutch around him, and his hands are on the horse's neck, and he suddenly feels it red, and it's red blood, because the, the, the mare has been shot, and, and uh, I mean, again, it's like, it's like a car, the horse is very much treated like cars, you know, the car is, is not going to last very long, but they're getting out of, out of range and be able to get round out of sight. And the man said, oh, you saved my life. He said, my horse, they hurt my horse. He said, but you saved my life. I don't care about your life. You saved, you killed my horse. Uh, and they got it out and the horse collapsed and died. But, you know, he, he would have been, you know, there's no reason, unless they were incredibly bad shots, they'd have shot him. Because he's running away uh, mm. and they've missed him a couple of times. Um, but if you've been through those experiences and a horse has saved you, uh, it's a, it's a, um, a thing we won't ever, ever leave you. One thing I wanted to ask you about as well, when Winston Churchill, after the Boer War, moves into politics, so he's no longer a cavalry officer, but that determination to see horses cared for as best as possible continues. And I'm thinking in particular the First World War and the repatriation of war horses and the fact that he devoted so much time and energy trying to bring horses back from the Western Front. Do you think that is connected to his earlier experience? Oh, oh no question. And of course, um, as anyone who's dealt with horses knows, it <laughs> one thing is, of course, horses can't talk, but they're sort of noble beasts. And the idea, <coughs> in a way, uh, uh, the idea that they are the dumb sufferers too. Of course, people are, are more important. But, you know, the, those brutal facts as we sent a million horses from Britain to the war, um, uh, First World War, and a hundred thousand came back. You know, I think the right word is do the maths. Um, and uh, again, Churchill very much was involved in that. And he, he um, well, they were important to him. I mean, you know, he, he, the animals were important to him, as you know very well at Chartwell. He had all sorts of piggeries and things, and all that thing about a pig being a wonderful animal and chickens. And you know, he, 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 he liked all that. And then the idea of racehorses, because of course his father, who he, he for all his flaws, or Randolph, he idolised his father. 
his father was you know fairly obsessed with racing too and his his father's colors you know, pink and chocolate they, those colors were the, were the very important to him so given that we're here at chartwell uh, it makes sense to talk about the role that horses played here and one of the things I love is that it's a passion that is taken up by the whole family. So, for example, in Mary's diaries, she writes that she has a horse called Patsy that she rides here. And as you said, it plays into that wider love of animals. What were the role that horses played here at that point in time, maybe before the war? Well, the, 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 again, this it's even now, I mean, just driving up here, a wonderful sort of rural spot, and the road's a bit busy. But back in the 20s, 30s, you know, this would be idyllic. And people would come and ride here. I mean, he talks about coming and friends coming down and, and riding for hours. A and as you say, I mean, don't forget that the, the Clementine was a very good rider. My favourite picture uh, of, I put it on the, f on the front of the um, paperback of my book, was Churchill and, and her riding together. Uh, her side saddle, but I mean, she you know she became very prolific rider. I mean, she was a very uh, good athletic woman. She was a good tennis player and things. Uh, and, and she rode here. She hunted here. He hunted here, uh, and but not so much because he was busy with it, uh, uh, polo and things, and, and also there wasn't much time. But uh, Mary did. And it's interesting. She, when war was declared in thirty nine, she actually was. She was at a stables, and they went into the. She went into the house to listen to it. Then they all went out and went for a ride, um, and it was all part of it. Uh, you know, it was all, all part of their life here. Uh, Peter O'Sullivan wrote. A, he was writing for the Express then, when it's seventy-five-year-old man um, uh, um, has good day out. And it, it's, it's describing Churchill arriving to watch colonists win it at Newmarket. Uh, he has made a speech in Holland the day before. He comes to uh, um, uh, Newmarket, watches the horse, does the Viva Victory sign, and then has a plane up to the Conservative Conference at Blackpool. Uh, and you know, there's cheers all round. Of course, it's good politics in a way, but again, it just shows the part it was all playing. And, and he then, again, it was a success. They bought the new chapel stud, which is now called the Churchill stud up there. And I mean, they had they won forty-one races. You know, it's, 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 they were um, uh, they won a lot of races, and, and they, or seventy-five races with forty-one horses. It, it's a, it's a, it was a, a, a really successful operation. And right at the end of his life, he had he had two horses, 1960. So he's what? He's 75. Uh, no, sorry, 85. 85. He's 85, and he's actually that's the year he wrote a note to Mary, I think, saying, um, "My life is over, but it's not yet ended." It's the saddest sentence you can ever write. But he did get happiness out of racing. And he had two colts, which he, three year old colts he bred himself at New Chapel Stud. They were called Vienna and High Hat, and they were both in the Derby betting. And High Hat actually got, and physically he got injured. And then Vienna had a big chance in the Derby. And on the morning of the race, when you were putting the shoe on, uh, the blacksmith pricked him. Uh, he got pricked the shoe so in, in putting the shoe on, so the horse couldn't run. And his quite inferior um, stable companion called Oroy uh, actually finished fifth. And uh, the jockey Jeff Lewis tells me he thinks that Vienna would have won the Derby that year. Uh, and he, he actually ran the St. Ledger, but he, he pulled too hard, he didn't really get the trip. But basically, um, you know, there he was very involved and, and he actually when he won the thing called the Derby trial at uh, to Epsom Vienna and uh, Churchill was in the box and he actually
came out, obviously he wasn't very mobile in his late, later years, but he came out and sort of waved to the crowd. Uh, and I remember people, the champion jockey Richard Dunwoody, his mother uh, was brought up at Epsom, and she trained his daughter, and she remembers him coming to watch the horse because his horses were trained by Walter Nightingale at Epsom, when Epsom had a lot of horses there, there those days. And he used to come up in his car uh, and, again, as you know, better than anyone here at Chapel, he, he liked um, to have things with sort of signature on. And he came and he would have a, the car would fly a pennant, like the royal pennant, the pennant was the, you know, the warden of the sag ports, the, the, the great pennant, and it come up, and she could remember him coming up, coming sort of pottering around the stables, and, and of course, very dangerous, that cigar everywhere, but... <laughs> but no, they were very important. Then there's a very, very sweet story that um, people will remember, but uh, by the time of his 90th birthday, uh, he was not in any great shape at all. But he was at... Um, High Park Gate, and they, the family came there, and they had champagne. Obviously, they also brought a cake in, and the cake was in pink and chocolate colours. His, you know, because he, the and they had, there's a very beautiful. You know, he didn't write many fictional things. But he wrote a short story, Winston Churchill, called The Dream. In it, he's painting a picture of his father, and his father. He falls asleep and his father is suddenly there with him. And uh, it, it, it uh, has a very good punchline in it. It says, because uh, he asked about things, he said, this happened, that happened, and we had a war with Germany. And he, goes, he said, you seem so well informed, uh, Winston, you, you should have really gone into politics. You might have made a name for yourself, which is that's the punchline. But straight away, he says, you know, so what are things that are happening now? And the Randolph, the ghost of Randolph says to Churchill, so is the, is the turf club still going? Do they still have the guineas and the derby? And Churchill says, oh, he says, have all those. And he, he's talking about those things. So that, the, so that image, those early days, are all part of his tapestry. And it, it's just, you know, whatever one makes of it, it's worth, it's there. And don't pretend it is not. No, it's not pretty. But I was fascinated to bump into that because obviously that's the area I know, and I never realised that this other great world was actually involved in mine too. I think when our visitors go around Chartwell, as you did as part of your research, they're often struck by how many references there are to horses going around this house, be it paintings of his race horses, um, his trophy from Goodwood when his horse won the Stewards' Cup. Um, Walter Nightingale's signature, quite frequently in the late 40s and 50s, his trainer here in the visitor's book, um, bronzes are horses. But I think for me, one of the most special things is when you go into his bedroom and the fact that there are so many pictures of horses there in his inner sanctum, his most private space. Thinking about this house and them knowing it would come to the public one day, what do you think it meant to Winston Churchill to have horses be so present throughout his home? I think he would, it resonates with where he was at because he had at times a quite unhappy childhood, um, you know, uh, alone a bit and any, when it, I've been lucky enough to have a happy childhood, but lots of people who have had the access to ponies and things, and they make uh, uh, a big difference. And you remember your child, I mean, that first letter I said, I read Rob Roy in the park. And then when he was, he went to a school in Brighton, and he wrote, he had riding lessons there, and he was getting better at riding. And he, he wrote to his mother, again, the letters I find, it was one thing that I was very lucky to get access to letters. A lot of the letters, people know them from excerpts in books, but if you read the whole letter and you then think, this is a 12-year-old writer to his mother, you know, hang on, let's get this right, this is an 11-year-old writer to his mother, you know, we've all... Uh, and I do so enjoy the writing, you know, um, I, I, I want to make this, I enjoy it best of all. That's what he was enjoying most, so a little boy riding, and then the achievement 
at Sandhurst. And his, again, he was, uh, his father was dying, but nonetheless, he was determined to sort of make him proud of him. His Churchill's description in the letter to his father of him taking part in the riding competition, which was a very big exam, so it went on all day. It's detailed and fascinating. We did this, we did that, we did this, and I did this, and I really, really I did the best I've ever done. And again, it is a 19-year-old child writing to their father with great pride. You know, if you're a, a, a romantic and a, and a, a, a wonderful describer, you, you can get all excited about that. And people no doubt here had to sit and listen as he described the, the future brilliance of these horses or indeed what they'd done it. And you know, he, as you know, he dictated letters. But I, I mean, he's coming back from Kempton Park one day and he's dictating that and it's all about, half of it is about whether Anthony Eden were able to handle something, some foreign crisis. And the next bit is all about the horse getting beaten at Kempton, you know, and what it might do next time. Uh, but that's the way he was, and it was, it was part of his life. And, and I think the, the, the horse element, of course, couldn't answer back or anything, and couldn't do you know, it. Didn't, was never against him. It's fate was against him sometimes. But when he looked around and saw horses, that was a reassurance. And it was back to always. He always had horses reassurance. They'd saved his life, and they'd kept him happy. Two quite good things that happened. Absolutely. I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much, Ruff. It's an absolute pleasure. And for me too. <laughs>